Hello there. So uh, here's the next episode of the uh, over-terrain vehicle. This is a small model and here we go to a little bit bigger. The one I've shown you in previous uh, videos. So that's in my study and uh, going down to the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> what do you know? Bigger. So there it is, the full scale skeleton. I started out with uh, bending some tubes, which turned out to just kink and fail. So uh, they were filled with sand and uh, everything, but it just, just didn't work out. So I opted for uh, cutting and uh, welding. So it's a kind of a slow process, but uh, uh, you get pretty good control over your angles and um, it's easy to make uh, four identical legs this way. So we have start welding, welding the seams together. And it was uh, really uh, interesting to learn to uh, TIG weld aluminum, thin, thin weld aluminum. Uh, a good skill to, to have, I think, to possess. So here I'm just trying to uh, make four or five level points in, uh, on the garage floor. And there will be a lot of 3D printing of uh, various jigs to make uh, all holes and uh, uh, well, all joints uh, perpendicular or in the correct angle. So I bought this uh, ginormous <laughs> PLA spool uh, for my 3D printer so that I don't have to change spool other times. So I think it's uh, like 9 kilo of PLA instead of 0 0.75 kilos. So here I'm using uh, one of the 3D printed parts to make uh, perpendicular holes in the um, main structure. Yeah, so this uh, this kind of material is pretty much the largest uh, largest uh, tubes that I can uh, handle in my workshop. So I really reached the limit of everything, both the uh, cutting machines and drill press and the uh, lathe and everything. So I'm notching the tubes here to. Uh, uh, make them accommodate all the legs. The main uh, part here, the, uh, yeah, the thick tube in the middle there, it's actually supposed to be cut off in pieces later on, but it's uh, there uh, in one piece now to, to make everything uh, straight and true. So you'll see that in a while that I will be cutting that apart. So trying to get every angle correct here and uh, lined up before I start to tack weld it and uh, finally weld it properly together. Uh, a little bit of difficult there to uh, join this uh, 1.5 millimeter tube to the 3 millimeter center tube in the middle there. So it's always difficult to join different gauge materials, but uh, it turned out to be, you know, just a skill that you can master. And I've been doing a lot of brushing and degreasing uh, since everything is aluminum and aluminum is very sensitive to uh, uh, impurities when you're welding. And this is the lovely thing with aluminum, it's light, so I can uh, fairly easy carry this structure around and flip it over and yeah, handle it on my own, which I appreciate. It makes, uh, it makes everything so much easier to not, be, uh, not have to call on help all the time just to you know, move stuff around. looks like an X-wing there, <laughs> wish it were, but it's, it's just your ordinary, you know, <laughs> multi-rotor something, you know, coaxial with control surfaces. I don't really know what it's called, what you would call it, it's a strange machine. Yeah, so here it's uh, the lovely welding. Uh, it's both like, you know, stressful and uh, meditative at the same time. And I'm trying to keep track of my settings, uh, depending on what I'm uh, welding at the moment, so you know, keep it close to the machine so I don't uh, forget it. So this is pretty decent. Uh, this is not, you know, every weld does not come out this good. Uh, some are crappier than others, but but most of them are pretty, you know, strong and good. Here I've been cutting away a lot of the cent center tube, 
and what's left is there for you know uh, holding the gearbox and uh, servos and stuff like that that will hopefully hopefully be you know coming on later on here's the gearbox temporary temporarily mounted uh, and I'm um, attaching it to the top there and there's a drill drill jig to drill accurate holes in both the uh, the gearbox and the uh, yeah the top part there that holds the gearbox in place so now everything is installed here so you can see the gearbox is uh, doing its thing so it's a four motor machine for redundancy and each motor will have a uh, yeah, here it is a Polini 202 each motor has a centrifugal clutch so if one motor fails you can still uh, you know uh, the propeller can still absorb power from uh, the other three working motors just some uh, measurements here on the motor and I have some uh, rubber parts there to uh, connect the motor to the uh, drive shafts to give a little bit of flexibility since it's a two stroke it will vibrate for sure so it's good to have some uh, uh, you know uh, room for that to happen so now I'm dry mounting uh, the motor just you know uh, trying to figure everything out aligning stuff I need to strengthen the upper part of the structure a little bit to get a you know a, well just a sounder structure that will carry larger loads with the less flex. Yeah, and then I got the great idea to you know try to take away the cylindrical, uh, the circular part of the <laughs> of the mold. It would be so much easier to store the the uh, machine if I could have this more square shape. So I reduced uh, the size of the control surfaces to to make it square. And I, of course, I had to try it in model scale before I before I tried to you know incorporate it in the design of the big machine. So uh, I flew this around a little bit and just to find out if the characteristics has changed. Uh, and it actually turns out that they have. So it's less uh, uh, you can oversteer it or you know it can come into a uh, attitude from which it cannot recover uh, because it has less control authority since I took away like one quarter or so of the control surfaces area so this unfortunately won't work but I did find out before I <laughs> incorporated it oh there it happened into the large scale model so just to verify I build new one <laughs> because I really did total the other one again with a circular uh, you know um, holder for the um, control surfaces with the greater control surface area and I actually did even uh, actually lower the center of gravity a little bit because that's more like the full scale version than just uh, trying out the the characteristics and it's uh, it's back to good. Uh, so uh, it's not easy to uh, you know uh, over tilt it and crash it. So yeah, back to the <laughs> to the full scale here again. So I had to you know uh, uh, go back to the circular under part there under carriage. Here's some uh, plumbing for uh, test running the uh, the motor. It's a liquid cooled motor, so it's uh, supposedly better to handle thermal shocks. And that's a good thing, of course. And um, yeah, it's some extra tubing, so it, it's suboptimal. I mean, it adds weights and everything, but it's uh, important to have you know a motor that is uh, as uh, reliable as possible. And I think uh, the water cooling uh, adds to the um, yeah, the overall capability and, and reliability of this motor. Here you can see the uh, the gas tank there. So could potentially hold uh, you know five five liters of fuel for each motor. So twenty liters of fuel to start with. It could be probably doubled from that. I think you, the uh, power is power is there to to carry that kind of load. So you could probably have like uh, uh, forty liters of fuel or so. And uh, nothing here is really, you know, uh, decided to, you know, final design. This is more like I'm trying this out, and I needed to uh, change the rubber parts there to a uh, higher hardness, uh, from 60 to 70 sure, uh, to have the uh, uh, torque transfer capability. I, I tested it with the torque wrench, and I needed more than 60 sure. So 70 sure was seems to be good enough. Uh, pretty stiff rubber. Yeah, and here you can see the yeah sort of you know 
temporarily you know solution for keeping the radiator in place just locked in there with some uh, stainless steel wire in the uh, yeah you can see it there okay so um, this is the uh, the setup that I want to uh, to just uh, test run the uh, gearbox in so you can see that there's place for three more of these motors if this uh, turns out well okay. and here's one of the annoying thing with uh, you know this is a paramotor and they're not really properly specified so it's specified to be like 16.8 kilos you know sort of uh, natural weight and I don't know how they came to that weight because uh, that must be without the cool uh, radi radiator and without cooling fluid and everything because I come in pretty much exactly uh, spot on at 20 kilos uh, when it's actually ready to run with you know uh, yeah cooling fluid and, and oil in the uh, transmission and everything and that's of course the the number I would have wanted to see in the specifications because I don't really care what it weighs I just need a accurate number and and the, the uh, number that Polini uh, states is just not accurate it must be missing significant parts of the motor so I think it's like 20.1 kilos or so when it's actually ready to run I have a little bit longer uh, cooling hoses here to the radiator, radiator than the stock motor would have but it's still definitely close to 20 kilos uh, when it's ready to run. So the first test here is uh, actually with the both, uh, well yeah here I'm mounting the motor first, just a quickie on that one. Uh, sort of cumbersome but you know working outdoors but it, it works. Uh, the first test is uh, with two uh, uh, aluminum uh, tubes instead of the proper propellers. The proper propellers are actually quite expensive. It's uh, it, I need two four blade propellers for this setup to, to work uh, and uh, it's uh, the uh, the EPROP propellers that I'm you know looking at but I'm just start starting out with a dummy load here so they're pretty well balanced but um, uh, <laughs> it's the motor is overloaded here you can it really not take this so I need to uh, reduce the load you can see it, it shakes but it's not really because it's uh, a imbalance in the propellers it's just the uh, motor really trying to over overcome the, the torque. So the, this was uh, apparent pr pretty quickly so I just uh, aborted this test and uh, uh, the easiest way is simply to remove one of the uh, dummy loads here, dummy propellers. So that's uh, coming up in just a moment here. And this is the first time uh, spinning this uh, system up here. I'm obviously taking some precautions, so I'm standing uh, behind the steel doors to the shipping container there. So here's with one dummy propeller, um, and that's a better match for the uh, for the power uh, available at this time. Uh, the uh, final gearing is such uh, that the uh, propeller will spin around uh, 1400 or 1500 rpm or so. And I really did not know what to expect uh, when it comes to how much load this was put, would put on onto the motor. But this was more you know, appropriate uh, for uh, one motor to spin this up to, to 1400 or 1500 rpm. Now here I'm just checking for you know, the general level of vibration, which I must admit was kind of uh, disappointing. It, it, the motor has a counterbalance shaft, so it, once you spin up the propeller to decent speed, it sort of smooths things, smooths things out quite a lot. So it's it's not that bad, but you know flight controllers are sensitive creatures, so it really is uh, suboptimal to have. Uh, uh, the level of vibration that I will have uh, when I'm using a two-stroke system. So I'm really uh, thinking about how to uh, proceed from this point because I'm not uh, I'm not feeling confident uh, on this setup at this time. Uh, but I really needed to just you know do everything uh, to this point to, to really feel the uh, you know get to know the difficulties and. Uh, so it's a combination of the motor being slightly overweight. I mean, it's just three kilos per motor, but since I will uh, need four motors, I will be 12 kilos 
over my estimations and that's uh, really a very negative thing in a veto uh, situation so that's bad uh, but other than that uh, uh, yeah it's it's the the vibrations and uh, i sort of forgot how annoying the two stro stroke noise is it's really not uh, you know a good match to <laughs> to uh, hovering or flying uh, like you know in a more poetic way and uh, so that's also a factor that i'm hmm, struggling with um but it was uh, super interesting and i could uh, try out the gearbox and uh uh, and it's uh, it's not even lukewarm, so it's uh, a lot more efficient than the <laughs> the, uh, the small scale uh, radio control gearbox, which gets uh, hot actually. But if you didn't you couldn't even feel the temperature rise. Just even the clutch there, it's not that bad. Of course, the the first test there was uh, you know really uh, you know a stretch for the uh, for the motor, but uh, I only ran it for like uh, 15 seconds or so. So that's I think it's good. Um, and it worked, worked well here with uh, with one dummy propeller, so that was more proper loading of the motor. Um, and the motor, of course, needs the running in and a little bit of tuning uh, to run, you know, as smooth as it as it can. But I'm still uh, feeling very, hmm, yeah, I, I really feel I need another solution for for the um, you know for how to power this machine. So I will uh, do some research and think about that and you know really longing for like more smooth turbine or electric power but electric power would give me just too short flight time so I would, I'm interesting in, in interested in trying some uh, you know turboprop uh, setup here but uh, we'll see what happens next. Mm. Yeah it's a great learning experience. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, this is, this is what uh, it is all about. It's about, you know, imagining things and building stuff and trying it out and, uh, you know, evaluate it, what you got. And, uh, uh, and the most important thing here was actually to see that the gearbox uh, worked because that's uh, the main thing with this design. Okay, see you in the next one. Uh, bye.